and thanks to the panelists for being here. Uh, you have a bio sheet for everybody, so uh, we're going to go past the introductions since we're running a little behind here. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it. And uh, I want to start off with one. Clearly, we have uh, people from sports franchises here as well as uh, advertisers and, and uh, from corporations. So some of the questions will be pointed uh, <coughs> toward one or the other. Some will be to both. Uh, I'll try to keep that as clear as possible for everybody. Um, we'll, we'll start with one for everyone. Uh, we'll go down the line. Uh, obviously, these are tough times in the economy, and consumers have increasingly turned to uh, various forms of entertainment uh, in downtimes, uh, movies, for example. Uh, we want to know if, in these rough times, you notice that uh, your sport uh, also uh, has people spending more time watching, attending it, uh, as sort of a means of dealing with uh, maybe some of the uh, emotional aspects of, of being in a recession? Um, the short answer is yes. I mean, I think we're all here related to sports in some way. Sports are a great outlet, a great vehicle for entertainment in, in, in all times, a good time, a bad time. I think a lot of what I'm going to say today is going to be skewed in a positive way by our successful season last year. Um, and Dennis and I were talking earlier, I wouldn't want to be facing this economy without having the championship behind it. Because I've talked to a lot of other baseball teams, a lot of them are struggling right now. You're always going to have sports as a great outlet for families and, and uh, a way to watch TV or go and enjoy it. On this economy, maybe it'll be better for everybody. I think, you know, in, in our area, we're, we're uh, more anticipating, um, due to the timing of, of the economy, some of the kind of the downturn, most of our suites, club seats, and marketing deals are already in, paid for, um, and accounted for last year well in advance of some of the major downturns that we face. Um, so really, we're kind of just really starting the process now where we're going to really start to see the effect. We just sent out our club seat and um, suite invoices. Um, and actually, so far, we've kind of weathered the storm fairly well. But a lot of it's more in anticipation of what may happen and really where, where we're headed. Barbara? Well, our, uh, the sport I'm involved in, tennis, um, we play our events in the summer, in July. So we haven't, you know, the if, if you consider that the economic downturn really hit in the fall, we haven't uh, been on sale yet uh, since that happened. And uh, that'll change in a couple of weeks when we do go on sale. So we don't really know yet what we're about to face. But certainly with everything that we're hearing, we're trying to gear as much as possible to um, make everything very family friendly, very affordable, incredible value. Uh, because we do think that, you know, it's, it's not like people aren't going out. They are going to events and want to be entertained. Um, and so we uh, will do everything we can to fill that void and give them hopefully what they want. Mark, how are you noticing on uh, radio with uh, interest of fans? I mean, does, is it a mainstay? Well, listenership is not really affected. I mean, what revenue is definitely affected. Uh, <coughs> affected. But um, the reality is, is that good products always sell. Um, when a team is playing well, there's always a tremendous interest in that team. We certainly had a, a much better January than we would have had had uh, the Eagles not have made it as far into the playoffs as they did. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no question. I mean, from an advertising standpoint, um, I don't think that we were hurt as badly as some other radio stations um, because there was such interest in the Eagles and certainly the interest in the Phillies over the course of the fall. It wasn't as bad for us as uh, you know as some other radio stations, but there's there's no question that people are being more picky about the decisions, the choices they make. Um, but I, I I do believe that people will continue to eat out and they'll continue to go to the movies. They're just going to select more wisely. John, how about from you can maybe speak from both a Philadelphia area since Tasty is definitely a, a mainstay here, and also maybe a regional uh, aspect going beyond these borders. I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> for everyone's benefit, and I don't know how much you all know about what Tasty partners with and what we don't partner with, but um, we currently have partnerships with both the Eagles and the Phillies, uh, as well as a small deal with the Flyers, and as well with uh, Mark's radio station. We sponsor their, uh, their studio right. How about a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Dave. That contract will be signed on Monday. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we are in a little bit of a unique situation because, as I was telling Barbara earlier, the, the 
you know, the economy while it's turning, and Frank alluded to this, um, you know, our partnerships are long-term partnerships. We don't look at them as one-offs, and especially in sports where the teams are not going away. It's not something that, you know, from an advertising perspective, you're just going to immediately say, I can cut that or I can't cut it. I mean, it makes you really have to leverage the, the longevity of those. Um, you know, we see, as, as Mark's business goes, it's very similar. You know, the success of the teams helps us. Um, and I would say the success of the team helps us, and when teams struggle, we don't see that impact as much because the loyalty of, and the fan base, especially in Philadelphia, is so, so passionate. Um, you know, if anything, we get complaints when uh, the teams aren't doing bad, just like the teams do, um, usually from our drivers. But, uh, you know, <laughs> from a regional perspective, I mean, every, everyone in this area, um, every team we deal with, which basically goes from kind of southern Virginia to New York City and as west as Cleveland, um, you know, everyone varies greatly. Um, but, and I'm not just saying this because they're on, on this panel, but the teams in this area are very, very well run. Um, and they run like businesses. And while they are great athletic teams, um, there's a business side to those teams that is tremendously important. Um, that it helps us as, as uh, you know, kind of agents of their equity um, to really leverage them more. I mean, you know, there are bad teams in this area as well. And as Dave said, some of them suffer more than more than others. So. And, and, and speaking of the teams. Uh, in terms of the ticket sales, uh, can you speak to obviously corporate boxes and, and suites uh, have become definitely a, a larger factor in uh, professional sports uh, recently. How, how has that varied in, in these economic times compared to uh, just individual sales uh, to people, you know, uh, not involved with box seats or, or group sales? Well, our, our, our boxes, like Frank said, they're all multi-year deals, so the economy's not affecting that right now, so that's, you know, a positive for us. Um, the individual tickets, our payroll, you might have read, went from 110 last year to 130 this year, 130 million. So you, you want to find a way to make up that difference if you can. In this economy, you can't go crazy. You've got to be aware, as Barbara says, what's out there and so forth. So we, we very selectively raised a little bit, a few of the tickets, but most of the tickets we didn't raise. So we couldn't, I mean this in a positive way, take much of advantage of the World Series as maybe we could have in years past and like really jack the tickets up like most teams do in a good positive way. Um, so boxes were fine right now, individual tickets, they're doing fine, they're actually up 4,000 a game right now um, and the ticket prices we tried to keep the same because of the economy. Frank, you, you have a different situation because basically eight regular season games a year. Is, is that less of a, a factor when it comes to the economics of the team? Yeah, uh, you know, you know, we hope so. I mean, um, you know, right now we, we just sent out our suite invoices. We've collected um, the, the payment just passed. We collected ninety five percent of them already. So we're, we're really down to a, few, a handful of suites that we're trying to um, be a little bit more flexible with to make sure we get the payments in and we get keep them as, as you know valid customers that we've had for years. So we're working with them. So you know, it's really down to a few. As far as our regular seats, almost um, all but basically twenty five hundred seats are on a season ticket basis. Um, so, and that single game sale will happen in June. Historically, they've sold out in about 10 minutes usually. So that we really haven't had a, uh, you know, a, an issue there. We in fact did raise our prices this year, um, mostly five dollars per ticket. Um, we were one of the few teams that didn't raise them last year. So um, the decision was made to raise them a, a small five dollars per ticket per game, which comes out to be fifty dollars, uh, including the preseason per per ticket. Barbara, you, you're involved with the team tennis right now. Uh, I know you do have some, uh, connections and, and a past with uh, the, the tour. Um, can you speak to both maybe and, and let us know from a team tennis standpoint how what the ticket, uh, how that typically works in, in terms of sales and, and also how individual, in an individual sport where the individual stars can have an effect on uh, the product, uh, how that kind of changes things uh, in terms of attendance and ticket sales. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tennis is unique that way in that we don't have a, uh, a set. If you're doing a regular tournament, uh, part of the, you know, one of the world tours, you don't have a set team. You find out every year who you're getting, and so you kind of live and die by 
your player commitment, which uh, can be a challenge. Um, and not only that, it's an elimination sport, so you live and die by who advances every round. So I always say I look a lot smarter when the top seeds you know, get to the finals <laughs> and they show up. But um, in team tennis, it's a little bit different. It's uh, the format, this is something that was created by Billie Jean King. It's a format where tennis is a team sport because she feels that there are elements of, well, she, she, when she grew up, she was um, uh, very active in uh, sports as a child, and her brother was actually a top, uh, you know, he was a professional baseball player. Randy Moffitt uh, played for a number of years, so she was very familiar with team sports, and so she's trying to bring a lot of elements of that to tennis, so that was the, um, the model behind World Team Tennis. So it's men and women playing together, and it is an actual team. However, to get the top players, um, the, the economic model doesn't presently work where you can have a Venus Williams or a Serena Williams playing every night for the Philadelphia team. So they've created a system where we bring in these marquee players, which would be a Venus or a Serena, a John McEnroe, and they would technically they could play for the Philadelphia Freedoms, but for one night. And then there is a core team, but we bring in the big names. And that's Let's face it, you know, that's what makes it is, you know, those nights we do very well. We try to leverage that uh, as much as we can. And what we're doing this year that's a little bit different is we're making, you know, an interesting decision in, in this economy, but we're actually making a big investment in our players and we're going to spend uh, more than double what we've spent in past years to bring in marquee players. And we will have every night we will have a top player, which um, hasn't been the case in the past. And, I would tell you who they are, except for who's sitting next to me and <laughs> who's uh, the panel. Talking to the well, we do, I, mean, I, I, I kind of remember at the end of last year, uh, uh, Venus Williams came in right after one of her. Uh, yeah, two days after she won Wimbledon. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. was uh, quite a, a coup, I guess, when you can have someone show up, you know, willing to show up. 48 hours. It might have been less than 48 hours, I think. Then. Yeah, it was incredible. That's what I said to her. I said, can you believe that, you know, two days ago you were in the center, the hallowed grounds of the center court at Wimbledon, and now she's in the parking lot of the King of Prussia Mall. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for, for Mark and John, uh, obviously, uh, when the economy is in a downturn, uh, there's going to be some level of scaling back in terms of uh, advertising and, and what type of creative ways do you try to get around that and, and try to um, work your way through it? We'll start with you, Mark. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, there's really no way to get around it. Um, the reality is is that every industry is a little bit different. There's been a correction in the broadcasting industry. Uh, um, cost of operations have been high the last couple of years and that was representative of a time where our industry was exploding. And that's kind of not the case right now. Uh, we've been retracting to a certain extent and for that reason we're trying to get our costs in line. The reality is, is in a supply and demand business, you know, you can't charge it and hope that they will come. I mean, the, you know, our, our prices are down dramatically right now and as a result of that there have been a tremendous amount of cutbacks, layoffs, I mean, it's unfortunate, but uh, all industries are being affected. Again, while listenership is not any lower or stronger, um, uh, advertisers have definitely pulled back to a certain extent, and uh, you try to weather it as best you possibly can. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would prefer to not overreact and weather through, but um, publicly held companies, and we're owned by CBS Broadcasting, kind of not that way. Uh, in fact, every time uh, we get a P&L at the end of the month, I'm concerned that I'm going to get a phone call that says reduce your cost by X amount. We didn't make the profit that we wanted. And that's been happening a lot in our in our business in general. And last, uh, those of you who have Sirius or XM have probably heard uh, in the next couple of days uh, Sirius and XM are going to file for bankruptcy. And uh, again, in the go-go days when they were both sort of invented, which was probably 10 years ago when it, people started to talk about it, People were paying tremendous amounts of money for content, Howard Stern, Major League Baseball, the NFL. And, uh, and the, the model just doesn't work. You just can't charge $10 a month uh, and have uh, an overhead of hundreds of millions of dollars to pay for that product. John, how about from the, the standpoint of 
you know, being a buyer. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, so <laughs> the first thing, I mean, from a, the, I'll kind of take it two, two ways. One, there's the teams, and then there's the advertising piece. And I'll, I'll say that differently because uh, kind of the relationship Mark and I have with his station is a little bit unique, um, uh, but for a reason. Um, you know, and, and just to kind of talk more on the advertising piece, you know, you'll hear and read constantly about companies having to redefine their advertising, look for ways to uh, make them more effective or more efficient, depending on what you're looking for. Um, when we started partnering with WIP about 18 months or so ago, uh, a lot of that partnership was trying to find a way to break through, you know, the proverbial clutter that everybody talks about and hears about in a way that uh, is really unique and actually um, We've kind of come to find it since we we did the deal, um, you know, almost two years ago, uh, was really one of the first in the country. Um, you know, to have studio naming rights for a radio station was unheard of, uh, and you're seeing it replicated uh, not only with CBS stations but uh, knocked off by other stations as well. Um, you know, it, it's a way to get to our core consumer in a really specialized way and in a in a media that is critical for us. Um, you know, anything we do now, especially with respect to teams, um, you, know, they, you know, by the time we get to the teams and we decide what we're working on, those cuts have already happened. Because what you'll hear from anybody that works in sports marketing is if you're going to spend money and, and really leverage a team, leverage a team. I mean, you don't just buy a deal and walk away. Um, you know, the, there's all sorts of rules of thumb. I've heard two to one, I've heard one to one. If you're going to spend, you know, a quarter million dollars with a team, you got to spend a quarter million dollars to support them, or you got to spend five hundred thousand dollars to support them. Um, and if you don't, you shouldn't have teams. So, um, you know, our our numbers are calculated before we go into negotiations with the team and evaluate. You know, if we're going to spend X dollars with you know Frank and the Eagles, you know, we're going to spend two X supporting that, and we know that before we go in and ask for something that we can't actually execute on. Um, you know, most recently, Dave and I have been working on a, on a program for this year and the years to come. And is that above the X? That's right. <laughs> so it's, uh, X is a X. It's like E. Different. Okay. <laughs> um, for the show. I, I, uh, but I, I will say, actually, you know, to, to the Phillies one because it's interesting. You know, as we've had to deal with with the economy and everything that's going on, one of the things we have done uh, a little bit different because it's one of our newer sponsorships is we really work hard on, on experiential programs. And what I mean by that is we are trying to find ways to do things that no one else does. And that's really important. It's important to the consumer that, you know, they can do something really unique and special with, you know, a world champion. And um, not everybody can do that. I mean, that's what we're looking for in a so, partnership. So, Dave and John, one thing to follow on that. Uh, obviously, Chase Utley is a, a guy who, you know, was signed on. Will, will you, Dave, uh, as an organization, get involved in all in that, or is that completely uh, between Chase and Tasty Cake? I mean, it obviously, I think it benefits the team certainly to have Chase as, you know, the, the face of Tasty Cake, and, and it, it offers kind of a, a secondary exposure. Did you, I'll take it. Okay, yeah. but there's there's a there's a funny story at the end, go ahead. <laughs> Wait, you want to tell a funny story? Funny ha ha? No, 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 funny unusual. <laughs> you know, um, we, yeah, quite honestly, we, we evaluate athletes and teams separately. Um, you know, in, in the beginning when we worked with Chase, uh, as we've done with the Eagles and Donovan McNabb prior, um, you know, it's a very easy and efficient way for, for companies the size of Tasty Cake to be more effective. Um, the struggle with any team is you don't want to give your star player away without the marks, and the marks come with cost. And um, as we've talked with every team, especially Dave and I, uh, you know, we, for those of you that may not know, we've been using Chase without the marks for several years. Um, now, we have not agreed or not agreed to a, a contract for Chase this year yet. Um, he had a two-year deal. It's not, you know, we're not kicking him out or anything like that. He had a two-year deal. It was a two-year deal was up, and we're working through this year. Um, but we do evaluate those separately. There are benefits and negatives to leveraging a specific athlete. Um, you know, that athlete gets hurt. Chase got hurt the first year we did the meet and greet. Uh, he hurt his hand, and uh, it was two days into a promotion. And we did the entire promotion. People still wanted to meet him, but he wasn't going to do anything when they met him. Um, so, I mean, those things get really challenging, and we deal with them kind of on a case-by-case -case scenario. Uh, as someone that worked with USA Swimming for years when I worked on V8 Splash, I can tell you the folks dealing with Michael Phelps right now, a little challenging. <laughs> um, so. John, I, I did want to ask you, I mean, Chase, obviously, and some younger guys like Cole Hamels, mm -hmm. uh, especially when he first came up, Ryan Howard when he first came up, uh, these are guys who... 
relatively speaking, are making uh, modest sums of money for the early going. Do you find it, is it advantageous to try and, are they more eager to, to try and have a deal to kind of subsidize themselves? Uh, well, you hear, I mean, you guys tell me if you disagree, but I think what you hear on the media about different people, their personalities, their attitudes, echoes purely into my kind of partnerships. I mean, every guy is different, or a woman is different, and some will do it for next to nothing because they want to be a part of Philadelphia. Some will ask you for seven figures, realizing my budget's just over seven <laughs> figures. Um, everybody's different, and uh, you know, in the case of Chase, Chase's agent actually reached out to us originally and said, I really want to be a part of the city of Philadelphia, and Tasty is a huge portion of, of the city. Um, everybody's different, you know, and, and I, yeah, I'd love to say that they were all the same, but it's, it's case by case. Okay, now I want to hear Dave's funny story. Well, I'm just, I'm going to elaborate a little on, can I do it? <laughs> yeah, I can, absolutely. Yeah. So, Taste Cake and the Phillies have a long history. I mean, when I was little, way before you guys were born or whatever, it was for a home, every home run a Philly hit, you got a, a case of Tasty Cake on radio and TV, and that hasn't happened probably in 20 years. People still talk about it, like, oh, you know, we joke about it in the office, oh, someone homered, oh, you got a case of Tasty Cake. So it shows, you know, the partnership can last forever. They've taken a break from us for a few years. I'm driving to work one day, and I see Chase Utley on a billboard for Tasty Cake. And that actually kind of spurred, you know, a year and a half of talks to get it going. We're like, they used them without the logo, which they're allowed to do, but it's like, why do you want to use a player without a logo if you can use it with a logo? It makes it look silly or whatever and it, it's absolutely it spurred us on with our success this year we used to we you know we had 10 years ago whatever we had years where we didn't have marketable players at all and it was never an issue it's now a big issue i've had two or three phone calls every day it's with player agents trying to either get in touch with our sponsors or telling us cole hamels i'll tell you last two years we fought him his agent was we're going to another bank. It was PNC Bank and we're going to be the spokesperson. And we play at Citizens Bank Park, so it was a problem. And, and it took us, you know, a lot of time over two years. We kept convincing them not to do it. They're not going to worry about it now because now we just signed them to a, you know, a $20 million contract. But with the success of the team this year and now all the players, Shane Victorino is very popular. I mean, he had two endorsement deals last year. Um, so a lot of these young guys have gotten the stage, the national stage, and, and so it's a fine line we're walking between what's right to promote the player and what's right to protect the team. And when I say protect the team, it's so we can make more money on advertising so we can pay their salaries. It all kind of works out. Sometimes they don't always understand. Well, that's a great segue because speaking of banks, um, you walk in, and as you said, Citizens Bank Park, Lincoln Financial Field, banks have definitely been uh, a part of uh, the revenue uh, building, uh, particularly new, new parks. Uh, and when you walk in those parks, you see, I remember walking in the Citizens Bank Park and the biggest billboard you would see is a, a Dodge uh, uh, ad mm -hmm. out in right field. Um, these, two, these two entities are, are you know, having probably uh, taken the biggest hit uh, in this economy. How uh, banks and cars? Yeah, banks and automobile industry. How would, how is that affecting you? And also, I mean, tennis certainly. We, like, I'd like to hear if that has had any sort of uh, an effect on that. Uh, well, the bank, you know, we're at a good time because we're with them for the next 20 years, so it's not a factor with 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 us. The Mets, you'll read about City Field, you know, every day that's in the paper because they got money from from the bailout, and that's an issue that. I don't know where that's going to end up, but I know it's in the paper every day, and I know that's not a positive for the Mets in any way, shape, or form. It's fine with me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> well, then it's good. Then it's positive. Um, Bank of America was going to do a, a very large deal with the Yankees, and it was very close. It was in all the trade magazines. A large deal, and that's been put on hold. So, again, it goes back to timing on how you know we're okay in the bank category. In the auto category, um, you know, we, two of our larger deals are signed, and they told us in you know November, they're like, I don't know if we can live up to it. Things have turned around a, li a little for them. They, they go, someday we're going to start selling cars again. We're not sure when, but we want to be prepared to sell cars. So we're okay right now, but it's a big factor out there. Frank, how's that been? Yeah, I think uh, similar, you know, Lincoln Financial Field, um, you know, we have a tour in a 20-year uh, contract, so for the naming rights, and, and we really haven't seen any effect there. 
you know, we had um, Sovereign Bank is also one of our major sponsors, um, and we there was some concern for a little bit while about the health of Sovereign Bank, and actually they were just uh, purchased by Santander, a, a Spanish bank, which is the fifth largest bank in the world. So. Um, I actually just had lunch with our bankers yesterday, and it seems like that that's in a much better spot today than maybe it was uh, even a month ago. Um, so I, from the banking category, I think we're, we're on solid ground for at least a little while. And then um, as far as the auto, Chrysler was, was one of our founding partners and one of our big, um, and similar circumstances, we've had discussions with them, whether they'll be able to live up to the, to the, to the contract. Um, and we're actually in negotiations with them right now, talking through some different things, whether we... Um, maybe restructure their deal, not restructure their deal, wait it out, see kind of what happens with the economy. So I think so, some of this is, so there's a lot of precautionary items that are going on, a lot of discussions that are happening, and, you know, I don't know if a lot has actually been finalized yet of where we really are. Well, for the uh, Freedoms, we've been pretty lucky. We've had Beneficial Bank, and they just renewed with us uh, at a, a bigger level, so we're very happy about that. And then we've had Lincoln Mercury for a number of years, and again, they have just renewed their deal. So we feel like we're, uh, we're in pretty good shape on those. And, and interestingly enough, just in the tennis world, uh, the bigger picture of the tennis world, there's a tournament in Indian Wells, California, which is the sixth biggest tournament in the world after the Grand Slams and the uh, Sony Ericsson in Miami. And they, so their sponsorship dollars are, are very big. And, and when they're looking for title sponsors, it's, you know, multi-million dollar deals. And they just signed a deal a couple of weeks ago with BNP Paribas as their title sponsor for a number of years. And BNP Paribas also just uh, signed to sponsor an event at Madison Square Garden, which is going to take place on March 2nd. It's a big uh, tennis event. It's the Billie Jean King Cup, and it's going to have Venus and Serena Williams and uh, and two other top women players. So again, you know, big bucks on that. So it's uh, it's just interesting. So I think in um, in our office when we're out selling, we're really trying to um, not go along with these trends. So if let's say we didn't have a car company right now, we'd be calling all the car companies because you know you just never know. So we try to separate. Uh, everything that you read on the financial pages, which is somewhat dire, um, and then just you know just get out there and and call on everybody we can because there really is no rhyme or reason it seems to uh, you know who's doing deals in these different categories. Mark, obviously, auto dealerships are, are a darling of, of sports radio. Uh, how has that been going? I mean, most of the business that we do in general is uh, transactionary. Uh, you know, it's it's not long term business. The longer term business we do are with um, our sports rights agreements, our radio stations, the CBS stations have all four of the major Philadelphia teams. And uh, you know, automotive is the lifeblood for broadcasting, so it's dramatically affected radio's business, it's affected television cable's business. And uh, you know, you have to develop programs that sort of get people interested. I mean, it, it's sort of when we saw, saw uh, a business change a couple of years ago. That's when we started to take more chances and do things like Tasty Cake Studios and uh, this partnership that we have with Comcast, a triple play partnership that we have with them. Uh, it, it just requires a, a, a different kind of thinking. Business doesn't go away. If automotive is soft, then you do what you can to preserve it as best you can, but then you have to start thinking a little bit differently and, and what can you do instead. Uh, I'll even say that... Um, you know, we had a certain level of expectations carrying both the Phillies and the Eagles as to what kind of revenue we would do because of the Phillies being through the playoffs in the World Series and the Eagles making it to the NFC Finals. And we came up short in both areas. Now, we, certain, we made m more money than we would have had they not been there, but even with automotive, which of course is the lifeblood for play-by-play for, uh, uh, -play sports because they do have longer-term commitments, um, a lot of the car dealers that we sort of expected to participate in the or, or automotive um, uh, uh, groups that we thought would participate at a higher level in the World Series and in the uh, football playoffs did not, or just had a, a smaller presence than we thought that they would. I did want to open it up uh, to the students if anyone had a question right here. Oh, wait, 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 wait. And the two best questions. Oh, yeah, two best questions. As voted by the uh, panel. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. What's your name? I have it in my car. Frank, I'm looking at a big four accounting and I saw in your bio that you work for PwC. How yep. does that 
translate into the job you currently do, and what was your educational background for your career? You know, actually, <clears throat> I was a, just a St. Joe's grad, accounting major, um, went to PwC, um, became a, a senior associate. I was an audit lead on some big clients, and to be honest, I, I luckily I kind of found out through a friend that the Eagles were interviewing and uh, sent my resume, went down an interview with Joe Banner, and uh, Luckily, kind of just everything fell fell in place, and I went down and to join the basically the accounting department of the of the Eagles. That was prior to the Novacare complex, prior to the stadium, kind of really prior to any real accounting uh, CPA at the Eagles. So, I, so I I kind of fell into it, if you will, um, and kind of was able to grow with with the team um, and and continue. All right, anyone else? Right back there. Uh, I have a question for Dave. He's going for the cap. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mike from Baltimore. Uh, I just had a question. Uh, what's been like the biggest differences between you know the various administrations of the Phillies, for, such as like Ed Wade and now with Ruben Amaro Jr. Is there like big, big differences? Sure. Um, I, I go back. I go back before Lee Thomas even. I go back to when there wasn't a GM, and then it was Lee Thomas, um, and then Ed. Ed was, Ed, Ed was a little misunderstood, I think. Ed, Ed actually had a very good sense of humor <coughs> that not many people saw. He did. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Um, <laughs> he, I don't think he presented himself very well uh, to the media, and, and sometimes he had an attitude and he was snippy, and it just kind of snowballed and made it worse for him. Um, Pat Gillick came in, um, a hero, just, you know, in three years what he did, he got us to the World Series. He... Not goofy, but he's just—he's like a regular fun guy. He's like your granddad, and he'll joke with you. Um, the thing I learned from Pat Gillick is that it's a long season. I think here's a good difference: Ed, Ed took every loss really, really hard, and and like you'd hear him, and and he was emotional. I remember two years ago in ninety in oh seven, our first year we made the playoffs in a long time. The Mets are crushing us one day, and he comes into our box where we're watching the game. It's like nine to nothing in the third inning, and we're like we're furious. He comes in eating ice cream. He goes, boy, they're kicking our ass today, aren't they? <laughs> Turn around and walked out, and we're like, what was that? Like, like, like he's yeah. not. So he brought he brought a like a calm to it, a season long um, perspective, and and Pat includes everybody. Pat is always talking. Um, he he talks to clubhouse guys from four years ago that knew a player to see how how that player reacts to certain things. Pat Pat taught a lot of people a lot of. Um, how to dig, how to get information, how to get information from from everybody. So Pat, Pat's an all-time hero right now. And graphic memory, right? Huge now. memory. Yeah. Phone numbers, just yeah. like, oh, you know, I got a call. Like a lot of our players, Greg Dobbs, um, we got through through Pat. Jason Worth, 24 home runs last year. Pat drafted him number one when Pat was at Baltimore, like in uh, 97 or 98 or something like that. Pat calls him, like remembers his number three years ago when he was a free agent and no one wanted him. Calls Jason Worth. Jason remembers the personality of Pat, and it was a big reason why Jason came to to sign with the Phillies and a big part of our, our team last year. Any other question? Right here. Um, well, regarding the economic climate for um, for today, and this kind of is a question for anybody. Um, but have you seen more of a trend where a lot of people are more staying at home, watching the games instead of going out to the stadiums and attending the games? And how do you kind of mitigate that risk and kind of bring fans into the stadium rather than have them stay at home, uh, especially if they have families and the costs are higher and that sort of thing? I mean, I think it's, it's tough for both of us to answer. I mean, they're sold out every game. And last year we set an all-time attendance record. So, like, the economy's in the paper every single day. It's a huge factor out there. But ours has been trumped by the team. So we haven't seen it, you know, TV ratings are great because the team's great. Attendance is great because the team's great. So I don't, I can't really answer that. It hasn't been a factor for us, but I don't want to belittle the fact that it's it's a huge deal out there for for certain. Yeah, I think it's more about, I mean, people are, generally in, in industry, people are worried about what may come and whether the economy's kind of at the bottom and we're going to start seeing the trend back up or how much worse can it is it going to get? What what industries can it get? I mean, you know, I know I'm in the finance area, and you know, dealing with we were dealing with our bank. We have Sovereign Sovereign Bank, and we have um, we do a lot of business with Sovereign. And a couple months ago, we were actually worried that Sovereign may have some issues, and we were looking at 
potentially other partners and other, you know, just to do our own business. You know, and one of the things people were saying was Bank of America, Bank of America, Bank of America. Now you start looking at the stock of Bank of America, you start looking, you're thinking, oh, uh-oh, you know. So I think some of it is like, where are we going and what, what are we at the bottom and it, what don't I know, you know, what, what's coming next? And just be trying to be prepared as possible. Let me answer uh, just from my perspective as well. I mean, it, people are definitely staying home more. I mean, we see it in our sales. I mean, people are eating out less. They're doing more at home. <coughs> Uh, they're being more frugal. You know, the reality of any of the sports teams I've worked with, and I think just in general, is there's only so many seats in that stadium. And as long as you know none of the stadiums here seat six million fans, uh, they're going to sell out. I mean, you know, that's kind of the reality of of this town, uh, with the t especially the two majors. I mean, if someone was sitting here from the Sixers or the Flyers right now, it's a slightly different <coughs> story. Um, but I mean, the reality, you know, as anything, I think Mark said, you know. Good products sell. You know, the, the Sixers are struggling. They've they've been highs and lows. They do some outstanding. I think they do a really nice job of bringing people in um, for a very long season and trying to do things to get fans consistently coming back. Whether it's deals on tickets or meal deals or you know, the Phillies do a bunch that are not called college nights anymore, but were called college nights. But they are college nights. College nights. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that, those kind of things are important. Um, yeah, I, you know, and I think maybe just to give Dave a little credit where credit's due. I mean, the Phillies had, I think, their record attendance for the for the season last year. Certainly, a longer season, but um, I mean, a lot of that, some of it comes from teams, and some of it comes from the marketing and the the work that they do to make events worth coming back to every single night, even if the team they're playing is <coughs> kind of average. That's the other hard thing about a sport. I mean, you know, if you're playing a team that stinks, nobody. Nobody cares, and you got to make sure that that's important. So, the deal we have the flyers is, you know, we we struggle with that some because you want to make sure the seats are filled. One thing I want to throw to five just to wrap it up. Uh, I mean, obviously we have some you know, entry level uh, sports business uh, students here, people who want to come in and, and get involved in this uh, in this job. It's popular. It's a popular thing, and, and it's a, a niche that. Uh, it's pretty selective. I mean, there's a select group of people who get an opportunity to work in this business. What, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to them as as they try to enter the uh, sports business? To to work for almost any sports team, minor league, single A, doing anything. Um, it's very popular. We have we have an internship program of like 25 interns every summer. You know, there's a guy and I can give you his name, but he's got you know 200 names a year that it, that he goes through, but. Um, you know, there are lots of minor league teams in the area right now. There's, you know, we have four in the area, plus there's Wilmington and Camden, some teams that aren't even affiliated. Just get your feet wet in anything that you can do uh, and help out and just uh, persevere and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, really just try to meet as many people as you can, get, get your foot in. Internships, I mean, um, I, I was, I'm a bad example because I kind of fell into it, luckily. Um, but, you know, since I've been there, you know, I've actually hired a few of the interns that we've had, both in the ticket office um, and on the finance side, some people that actually have worked through as interns. It's a great way to meet people, to build your resume, to get to know people in the industry. Um, we've also helped interns get jobs other places because of references. So, I mean, really just start talking to people, get in, figure out what you want to do, um, make some connections, meet who you can, volunteer, help out, intern, whatever it may be, but get involved. Barbara? Yeah, well, I mean, definitely an intern program. That's that's the way to go. We we utilize that quite a bit, and uh, anyone who gets a permanent position, that's usually where they came from. But I think the other thing too is that you're probably interested in this field because you like sports and you follow certain sports, and you might have a passion for it. But once you get into some type of a position, an internship, it's really a business first, and you really want to show that side that you're really into the business part of it even though you might love the sport, as opposed to the other way around. Mark, how about from your line? I would definitely say to take advantage of the opportunities that you have along the way. You know, when you're sitting in meetings like this, and if some of us say, you know, we're more than willing to talk to you, take advantage of it. You would be surprised how often I speak in schools, and I've really spoken at all the colleges in Philadelphia at one time or another, and I always, I, I, I'm a former intern, I was hired, uh, after undergraduate by uh, the radio station that I interned for and I always said to myself that if, if I was ever in a position to hire people I would treat people better than I was treated 
um, because it was very tough to get in the door when I was looking for a job, and, and then fortunately uh, the radio station Power 99 FM hired me. Um, but you know, you gotta. A, a lot of people are not aggressive about these things. The internship program is the absolute best thing you can do. You get college credit for it. It gives us an opportunity to look at you. It gives you an opportunity to look at us and decide whether this is something that you want to do. Because no matter what end of sports or entertainment you're involved in, it's so highly competitive. If you don't want to do it, we'll figure that out very quickly, and you you you'll you will not have any more opportunity after that. You know, just echo, I, I like how everything everyone said with a couple of additions. I mean, first, just because we're here from representing kind of three elements of the sports field, there's lots more. And I, I would suggest if you're really interested in sports, to look at them all, whether it's the agencies that support our work, whether it's the agents, which I saw that you used to work for IMG at one point, uh, whether you, know, you're, you want to be on the legal counsel side of it, um, there's tons of opportunities in sports marketing, and I would, I would suggest you kind of look across all of them. Um, I won't do what I did last time, but I will kind of make a minor example. Uh, last time I was here, I asked people to raise their hand if they had a resume with them. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'll bet you that 90% of you don't have a resume with you. And to use Mark's, uh, Mark's uh, kind of example, 100% of you guys should have resumes. It doesn't matter if you're a sophomore, or your senior, you're sitting facing five of the top, you know, team slash agents slash company representatives uh, in this area, and you know you should be handing it out, even if you don't get a call back, hand it out again, hand it out again. Um, it's hugely important. Internships are so competitive now um, that that you know you need to do that. And the last thing I'd say, you know, Dave mentioned a bunch of the minor league teams in this area. Um, there are just baseball in general. There's 17 minor league baseball teams in the four states around here. Um, I just know because I did a deal with them last year. Um, but you know, mobility is key. Some of you don't live around here. Um, you know, if you want to look and you really want to be in this industry, don't keep yourself locked only to this area. I mean, you should be able to go and be in Richmond, Virginia. You know, with the Richmond Braves or whatever they're called these days. If that's what you want to do, you've got to make that sacrifice.